Good afternoon, everyone. It's Sandy Dunn from Bourne, Ontario. We're just uh, um, doing final logons. We have about five minutes to go. Before we start, we're going to put our phones on mute. So if you uh, have logged on, just be patient and we will be back online right at noon. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's Sandy Dunn from Bourne, Ontario. If you've joined the line for our Bourne Provincial Round, we will be starting in a couple more minutes. Uh, just to be patient, we will be back on right at noon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Sandy Dunn from Bourne, Ontario. I'm the Knowledge Translation Specialist at Bourne, and I'm uh, here to chair this session and welcome you to our October session of Bourne Provincial Rounds. Um, we will be starting shortly, but just a few notes to say um, that the session will be recorded and posted on our uh, Bourne website 
uh, within the next few days. So if you have colleagues who have not been able to join us today, please um, know that the webinar will be available in the future. Um, we will have a question and answer session uh, following the presentation, but we will work through the presentation uh, with our two speakers first, just to make sure we, um, we are able to get all the information out to you. Um, and uh, the other uh, information is related to the question and answer process. You can either ch uh, type your question into the chat box or um, call in to the phone queue. If you press 01, you can enter your uh, call into the phone queue to be in the question or press 02 to remove your call out of the phone queue. Either way, but we, I will remind you of that when we get to the question and answer session um, later on in the, uh, in the hour. So it's uh, with great pleasure I have to introduce this topic, a snapshot of maternal child care in Ontario for 2011-2012. And our two speakers uh, for today, my two colleagues here, uh, Dr. Ann Sprague, who is the manager of the science team at Born Ontario and has been uh, integrally involved in the development of um, the data um, analysis process and the, the slides that have been developed to provide this snapshot of maternal child care. And our colleague uh, Sherry Kelly, epidemiologist at Bourne, Ontario, who has been uh, uh, also integrally involved in this, um, in this process. And between the two of them, we have wonderful information to share. So the objectives today are to provide you with an overview of the 2011-2012 BORN program report that has just been uh, released. Also to go through the 2011-2012 BORN LIN slides to present a highlight or a snapshot of some information and to review the new BORN information system reports that are available within the, uh, in the biz now for, for users. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Anne uh, first, who is going to lead off with the talk. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, Sandy. Um, certainly a pleasure to be able to share this data with uh, most of you today, many of you who, who actually contribute data to the BORN information system. And while this data is from 2011-2012, we're pretty close to being able to share the 2012-2013 data with you too. We've almost closed that fiscal year. Um, so a big thank you to everybody who provides this data and lets us be able to um, share and, and see what we're doing with the good things and the, the few things we still need to improve on in relationship to maternal child care in the province of Ontario. So I'm gonna kind of fly through these slides Really important um, for, for those of you sitting in the audience to first of all try and figure out, if you don't know for sure, what LIN you are uh, living within and working within because we are going to present a lot of data by the LIN. So first of all, just to remind us about the Born Information System that went live in 2012. We've had very good uptime since uh, we've gone live, so that means that the system's working as it should. We have over about 140,000 babies each year from the 106, 5, 4, 3, 2, depending on the, the month of the year, uh, hospitals that provide maternal child services in Ontario. All the midwifery practice groups, and this number will vary a little bit from um, year to year as well. All the prenatal screening results from five labs, and we know about 70% of women are screened in Ontario. All newborn screening results from uh, Newborn Screening Ontario, and about 100% of babies are screened. Most NICU stays, we're still working hard with some, uh, a couple of the NICUs in Ontario to be able to bring their data into the system. And some of the prenatal and newborn screening follow-up clinics. We have now about 5,000 unique users and nearly about 500,000 babies in the system. So lots of data. There's, uh, more ba there's more data than there should be because we backloaded a couple years of uh, the historical NIDA data into the system as well. <clears throat> Um, so the Born Information System, as we said, went live in uh, April 1st, 2012. In January 1st, 2013, we've now brought on the Ontario Fertility Clinics as well that are contributing data into the Born Information System. And the big benefit for that group is they'll be able to see the outcomes for those uh, babies from the cycles of IVF that do occur. Public health units will soon gain access to the system. We're getting pretty close. And for those of you who want to know more about the data that's collected, you can look in the data dictionary. <coughs> To remind you that we have uh, information from across the maternal child continuum, 
And um, Carter Plus is the fertility data set on the top left uh, side of the mother arrow. And then our, we span right through um, from uh, pregnancy, labor, birth, midwifery. The ones in blue are still pilot projects that we're working on. Um, the child, of course, we get the birth of the child. Right now, from a full data set, midwifery care goes out to about six weeks postpartum. Um, but for, the, for further on, we are now working um, with some folks in the autism world and also uh, for uh, getting the 18-month well baby visit integrated into Born. So those are still pilot projects, but look for those uh, new things to happen in the future, which really just expands what we'll be able to do with the data looking at um, the outcome for those children as they get older. So now what I'm going to do is provide an overview of the 11-12 uh, Born Program Report. And these are just some big uh, colorful uh, slides that tell us a little bit. Remind you that there are uh, reports on our website from previous years of things we've done. The newest one in, on the right side from 2012 looks at some of the indicators that were published for other provinces in Canada through the Public Health Agency. And we created a companion document for those. So if you're interested in that, those are all on our website. The 11-12 Born Report went live just the other day. It was released yesterday or the day before, I think, and that now is on our website as well. If you want to learn a little bit more about Born in general and some of the high-level data, you can look to that report, and that's an awfully cute little baby, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some of the highlights. Just to remind us, there's about 142,000 uh, babies born each year in the province of Ontario. So we want those children and their families to have the best possible beginnings for the lifelong health, and that's really where we move from in born, trying to ensure that. Uh, about 43.3% of women who gave birth in Ontario were first-time mothers. And why that's important is later on when we look at some of the interventions, it will be important to think about the fact that we have a unique opportunity um, with these women especially to prevent some of the <clears throat> interventions that can lead to subsequent interventions like cesarean sections and things like that where repeats happen. So important with that group to get uh, everybody off to a good start. About 91% uh, of births um, in, in Ontario were at term, which is where you obviously want the vast majority of your babies to be. And interesting news uh, yesterday, I think some of you may have seen there's um, looking certainly in the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists about uh, what they consider to be term. So we've always considered term to be 37 weeks, and everybody is on the bandwagon these days uh, with good evidence to back it about why maybe 39 weeks is more an appropriate uh, definition of term, but you can look that up. And then about 3.6% of pregnancies resulted in multiple births. And we all know, I mean, very cute. Uh, but certainly um, has a certain set of challenges for both healthcare providers and parents as they go forward. Um, so that's just to let you know some information there. And about 63% of term babies discharged from hospital were exclusively breastfed. So sounds great. Uh, good number. It's up from a couple of years ago. So we're making progress, but still a ways to go, I would say. So I'm going to move on now and actually drill down this data a little bit to look at the data that um, <clears throat> has been compiled for the 11-12 fiscal year by Lynn. And we're going to look first at a profile of the obstetric population. So this is the distribution of hospital births by Lynn. So as I mentioned, as you're sitting there, it's important to know what Lynn you work within. Um, and these span right from southwest Ontario down in the number one Lynn. Um, across the province, uh, certainly to central province, and then GTA, and then down e you know, the eastern part of the province, and then up in the north. And so you can see what we've included there are the percent of uh, births that happen in that LIN, as well as the raw numbers of, of babies. And so obviously the vast majority of babies in the province are born within the GTA when you add up LIN sort of five to nine. And I think there's probably over 60,000 babies in that, in that category. So Lots happening. You can see where you fit in relationship to this across the province. <clears throat> this is the distribution of women in midwifery care that gave birth at home. And so um, you can see now that about in Ontario, uh, there were 2,990 babies that were born um, at home out of the total. And so you can see what's happening in each of your limbs. Uh, about some, uh, some of the percentage of, this is actually the percentage of those babies born at home. Yeah. 
not of the total numbers for the problem. And then uh, we move on to look at the proportion of women that are less than 20 years of age at delivery. <clears throat> Why this is important is because both from a, a socioeconomic and certainly some of the physical risk factors that happen during pregnancy, um, it's important that we think about um, services for these women. And so we can see certainly uh, teen pregnancy, uh, higher levels in the north, which we know of, and then uh, different levels from across the province. And uh, this just shows a trend line over the last five years of what's been happening with teen pregnancy. So the rate's going down somewhat. And I guess we would all pretty much agree that's a good thing. And this is on the other end of the spectrum. We hear a lot about um, elderly women <laughs> giving birth. But I don't think anybody would agree 35 is elderly these days. But certainly uh, the proportion of women greater than 35 years at delivery, um, you can see there across the province the different levels. Um, as to what's happening in that in that area, and certainly from a trend line perspective, we know that has been increasing. It's pretty stable since last year. This brings another set of challenges. Of course, <clears throat> older uh, women that are older when they have their first baby um, may be more financially stable, which is a good thing. But from a risk factor, we're getting into more chronic disease associated with those women, and uh, so we are always uh, conscious of that as well. And uh, this is the proportion of women who were nulliparous at delivery. And I think we saw that in the big slides earlier as we started, um, where you can see about 43.3% of the women in the province um, being nulliparous um, by Lynn of birth. And no, uh, no big outliers there. And so this is um, <clears throat> 35 years of age and nulliparous. So now you're talking about women having their first baby at more than 35 years of age. And we can see there's a difference certainly in the central uh, Toronto Central area, but everybody else uh, seemingly about the same. And maybe somebody from Toronto Central can give us some perspective on that after in the question period. So let's move on now and talk just specifically about the pregnancy. Um, this is a proportion of women who didn't attend an antenatal visit with healthcare provider during the first trimester. Um, you'll see a number of asterisks in this data, and that means there's missing data in here that might uh, change this estimate a little bit. And two LINs at all where we couldn't report on that because uh, there was so much missing data that you know, we, don't, we don't report when it's that high. So this is concerning, um, certainly, um, that in fact, you don't know if it's an access issue for care um, or whether there's something else going on that might be affecting the ability for those women to get into a healthcare provider. Um, so, you know, we know that uh, starting prenatal care early and having regular prenatal care is important. And certainly from getting um, the prenatal screening done at an appropriate time, um, those women need to connect uh, with a health care provider. So obviously some work to do in, the, in that area. And uh, this shows us the proportion of women who have what are maternal health conditions. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, although it's quite small, what those maternal health conditions include. And this could be, um, and, and, and might I mention, just as we're going through here, this is still based on the 11-12 data, which was the historical nine-day perinatal database. In 2012, when we went live with the Born Information System, some of these things are now grouped differently. But in this case, we're talking about things like uh, any of the dependence syndromes, any drug use, any hypertension, thyroid, psychiatric, um, HIV. So this is maternal health conditions during the pregnancy. And while this looks like it's been going up, we also have to remember that the ascertainment of this has been increasing as we went along in born. So in fact, we should be getting to the point at 11 or 12 where we're probably seeing what it has been all along, but we just didn't ascertain it as well. So that's uh, the percentage of women who have a maternal health condition. And the same thing related to obstetrical complications. And so you can see at the bottom what's included in that, which are things like gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension, um, growth restriction in the baby, abruption, previa, preeclampsia, things that happen um, <clears throat> uh, during, during the pregnancy that are directly related to obstetrical issues. And so again, we've seen a leveling off in the last few years, so we're probably pretty close to what the right amount is. This is the rate of assisted conception by Lynn of birth. So these are women <clears throat> who would have had some kind of fertility treatment. Again, a lot of missing data in this, and I'm happy to say that as of January 1st, 2012, 
the IVF clinics in Ontario are contributing data directly into the born information system. So while we won't have um, pregnancies that are associated with um, ovulation stimulation uh, drugs such as Clomid, which is fairly common, we will have IVF cycles and other things. So in fact, hopefully this data quality will improve over the next year and we'll start to see exactly the outcomes um, uh, for the, the children that are conceived as a result of this conception. So let's move on and talk a little bit about maternity health services. Um, you'll remember, you'll see some of these slides are presented based on levels of care. The levels of care in Ontario changed as of the spring of 2011 um, as a result of the working group that the Provincial Council for Maternal Child Health convened. So this is uh, PCMC8. So what you're seeing in this data are the sort of the historical level one, two, three um, levels of care. The next set of data that we're able to show you next year will have the newer levels of care reflected in it. But for now, um, what we're seeing is based on level one, two, three. So these slides are a little busy. Um, <clears throat> but basically what we're looking at here is the distribution of live births at each level of care by Lynn region. So now what we've done is grouped Lynn. So you'll see at the bottom of, of the graph, we have uh, Erie St. Clair and Southwest grouped together. We have um, the other ones grouped as to the normal transfer patterns that occur across the province. And so, for example, um, what we see here is level one is the dark uh, line at the bottom. Level two hospitals, which are probably the most prominent uh, of the hospitals in the province, are the yellow. And then we move up to two plus and there's modified threes um, across the province in the old thing, in the old category, sorry. So across Ontario, the majority of live births took place in a level two hospital, so about 45.5% of births, followed by 22.9% in a level two plus hospital, and 11.5% in a level one, and 6.5% in a, uh, sorry, that should be level three. Um, yeah. 11.5% in level three and 6.5% in, in a, a modified level three. There's a mistake in the slide there. Um, so um, you can see there are geographic differences, but basically, um, and those geographic differences reflect the hospitals that are available in those particular areas. So you know, no, no judgment calls here about what's happening. Our next slide, however, deals with where the babies are born. And while this is, a, this is really important, because we know that babies, certainly babies under 32 weeks, so the, the three bars on the left side, most of those babies should be born in a level three center, um, certainly under 30 weeks in a level three center. And so you can see, you know, at, well, let's look at 24 to 27 weeks, probably really critical here. 66.7% of those babies are born in a level three center and 2.8 in a modified three, so, you know, roughly 70% there. But there's another 30% of those babies that are being delivered in um, areas that are out of scope. So there's lots of work to do to figure out why that's happening. Is it an access issue? Is it a bed congestion issue? Is it a transfer issue? Is it women showing up at the very last minute um, and not having time for transfer? So lots of stuff to look at here within these particular areas. And we, you know, within the data, we could break it down further. Um, and 42% of infants born during a gestational period where survival is low, less than 24 weeks, were born at a level three center. And there are, um, you know, a groups looking at and have looked at the, um, you know, the, the issues about whether you uh, transfer babies less, that, that just, less than that gestational age or offer them compassionate palliative care back in their own center. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, we'd have to break this down and you would all have to look at your own practice in those areas to figure out what, what's happening. Um, a little bit more related to birth now. And so these are about care providers. And so we know that the vast majority of people who attend a hospital birth in Ontario are obstetricians. And I think the proportion is just about 85% of, 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 <clears throat> of women who are delivered uh, babies by obstetricians. Obviously the women deliver the babies, but the obstetricians attending. And so um, you can see that family doctors and midwives perform smaller amounts of, uh, attend smaller amounts of these deliveries. And it's very much based on um, 
sort of area of the province. You can see in Lynn 14, for example, which is northwest, I believe, um, that in fact many more family doctors and midwives um, are, are associated with, uh, with care. Now the other is when people enter data and sometimes a nurse manages to um, deliver a baby or, I don't know, the taxi driver on the way to the hospital, um, sometimes that's reflected in others as well. <coughs> And so uh, now we're looking at some of the practice issues that we know where there's clinical practice guidelines that tell us what we should be doing. So fetal surveillance is always one of those issues where we have questions because there have been <coughs> clinical practice guidelines <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for some time that tell us what we should be doing. And across Ontario, the majority of women still receive electronic fetal monitoring alone during labor. And a further, almost 30% of women were had some kind of combination of monitoring. And so the clinical practice guidelines say for low-risk women, um, for the vast majority of those women, uh, intermittent auscultation should be used as a primary method of fetal surveillance. And we can see that that's not happening in a lot. And I'll break this down a little bit further for you. And so here you can see, um, uh, this is the rate of auscultation only for fetal surveillance during labor by Lynn of birth. And certainly the Southwest group stands out there as uh, <clears throat> have managed to find a way to do this more often than anybody else. And um, so, you know, learning best practices, we probably should be talking to the folks in the Southwest. And you can see here's the trend line for the last few years. So it, it has gone up a little bit, um, but still much work to do. But probably more important is when we actually look at the rate of auscultation only for fetal surveillance among low-risk women. So this is when we exclude people with risk factors. And this is probably the more important group we should be looking at data-wise for this. And you can see that then the Southwest group really stands out um, in um, being able to do this with low-risk women. And so, uh, you know, <clears throat> maybe someday down the road on a webinar or something, we might uh, invite that group to be able to talk to us a little bit about how they're doing so well and share that knowledge with everybody. And this again is uh, the rate of auscultation only for fetal surveillance among low-risk women and we've slipped over the past year. So again, uh, we know it's difficult implementing clinical practice guidelines. There's lots of things, uh, you know, assessing the barriers to changing practice is an important part of that before trying to this is the rate of labor induction by Lynn of birth for the province of Ontario. And so we can see overall uh, in Ontario about 24.3%. And people are pretty much gathered around there. There's a few outliers there up close to 30. Um, but this is all comers. This is all induction. And so obviously it's more useful to break it down and look at smaller pieces of this. So I think we're um, <clears throat> you know, doing some work in that area now. And you can see it hasn't really changed much over the past couple of years. It's got, started to go, go down a little bit. So that's encouraging. But probably, again, more work to do. But when you take a standardized nulliparous woman, so this would be a woman who uh, has a single, um, single baby, term, vertex presentation, uh, and I'm not sure, I can't remember for exactly if we took out some risk factors here, um, but you can see that the rate among that group is coming down a little bit, which is as good as well. However, just to go back, I'm, you know, is this the right rate for induction among this group? And I don't think we know the answer to that yet. And so <clears throat> taking off one piece of the induction issue, this is an indicator to recognize from the Born Ontario dashboard. And so this is the proportion of women who were less than 41 weeks just of gestational age at delivery among all the women who were induced where the indication was written that they were post-date. So uh, you can see here that the practice is kind of all over the board in this. And so this is one of the reasons, this is an, indi uh, you know, an indication that we shouldn't be intervening um, in the, these women that are only post-dates with no other risk factors if, in fact, uh, they aren't of the gestational age at which the recommendation is to intervene. And so you can see there are areas of the province that are doing very well on this, certainly in Mississauga-Halton, Toronto Central, 
and areas of the province where there's still work to do. And so we've established a benchmark uh, for this indicator that you'll all find on your Born Ontario dashboard when you log on to the Born Information System. And you'll be able to see at a green, yellow, or red level how your uh, individual hospital is doing on that. So we've aggregated this up to the LIN, but each of you have the ability to look at your own hospital performance on it. And this is the rate of assisted vaginal delivery. So this would be your vacuum or forceps and or both. And I can tell you from some work we did a number of years ago, the rate of using two instruments is only about 1%, and in fact, it's recommended not to do that um, because of the, the, uh, things, the risk factors that occur as a result of that. But, I mean, there's occasions. But anyway, this is mostly just forceps or vacuum. And you can see that <clears throat> the rate for Ontario is about 13.3%. So um, you look at that, and, and that means that, you know, there's women who require assistance in the second stage of labor to deliver their baby. And there are guidelines for providing care during the second stage of labor, uh, clinical practice guidelines out there. should be uh, certainly looking at that. And then <clears throat> this is the trend line for, um, for looking at assisted vaginal delivery in the last five years. So, you know, we're pretty stable from where we were last. And this is the rate of assisted vaginal delivery, again, breaking it down into this standardized nulliparous population. And so you can see the rate in Ontario is about 23%. And there's a, you know, in the north, uh, northwest certainly, they're a little bit lower. And most everybody else is around the mean here somewhere. It's some just a little bit higher. And uh, again, just the trend line for that as well. So you can Next slide is the rate of cesarean delivery. So when you combine the rate of cesarean delivery and the rate of assisted vaginal birth, these are the, these are the numbers that we're getting at of, of people who are having some kind of intervention in their, in their delivery. And you can see the rate for Ontario is about 28.4%. Everybody agrees that, in fact, um, everybody agrees that we need to do, we need to look at cesarean section, but nobody knows exactly what the right rate of cesarean section should be. And it probably is different comparing, uh, looking at the population that you deal with on an ongoing basis. And that's why it's important for us to take a, a look at cesarean section by small populations. What, you know, what is it by nulliparous women? What is it in multiparous women? What is it in women with risk versus no risk? And <clears throat> many of you who have access to the Born Information System can slice and dice your cesarean section data a little bit further to be able to break down and be able to do that. You all have access to the Robson report in the Born Information System, which allows you to see the population in your institution where you can probably make the biggest difference in cesarean section. And many of you would see that the, I mean, repeats are the highest proportion of cesarean sections in the province. And so by intervening to prevent that first cesarean section, is where we're going to make the difference in repeat. And so, again, um, being able to look at guidelines for management of labor, um, uh, induction, those sorts of things. And this is our trend for the last number of years. So we're pretty stable. Is it the right rate? I don't think we know that. Uh, the World Health Organization tells us it should be 15%. Uh, other people will argue that, in fact, it should be um, a little bit higher, and by having higher cesarean section rates, we in fact are preventing morbidity to babies, but nobody knows the right answer to that question yet. And here, this is the indicator from the dashboard. So again, this is what you would see when you log onto the Born Information System. And this is tackling one aspect of cesarean section. So this isn't about whether it should be done, this is about the timing at which it takes place. So again, this is the lowest risk cohort of women, women who have no other reason for having a cesarean section other than it is a repeat cesarean section, um, which she and her physician have agreed upon, is the best course of practice in that particular situation. And <clears throat> these are the ones that are done prior to 39 weeks gestation. And from the evidence in the literature, we know that um, babies uh, of w women who have cesarean sections done prior to 39 weeks gestation are more likely to have respiratory difficulties and are more likely to spend some time in a neonatal intensive care unit 
and probably have some feeding difficulties and things like that as well. So this is not best practice and we have a ways to go in Ontario, which is why we have this on the dashboard and why many of you in your settings are working hard to decrease your rates. So the rates have dropped slightly, um, but we're not near where we need to be in terms of a benchmark. So still work to be done. And this is just to show you, um, uh, so the group at Health Quality Ontario were working with Born, and I think many of you would have seen in the past few days uh, a notice uh, out there on the web that says Health Quality Ontario is about to issue a report on cesarean section, and you can go and comment on the report, but part of what they did was ask Born for some data. And <clears throat> the Robson criteria, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is a way of classifying women into 10 mutually exclusive groups and looking at the cesarean section rate by those groups. Robson group 1, 2A, and 2B are nulliparous women. And we took a look at that, at those nulliparous women that were low risk in a normal age group of 20 to 34, I believe, and we looked at the cesarean section rate across the province for that group. Um, we took out risk factors. So in fact, you'd think that this should be pretty much the same across the province when you have a standard patient population and you've taken out the risk factors. And you can see the variation from down at 4.5% all the way up to 35.5% across the province. So there's um, work to be done here, I would say, for all of us to um, find some strategies that we can use to uh, work uh, care providers and women um, to figure out the best practices in caring for women during labor to prevent this from happening. Because this is the group that is going to go on to have, uh, many of them will have repeat cesarean sections. And there's a number of groups across the province that are working, have demonstrated some effective strategies. Um, I think certainly we've heard about the story at Markham Stovall and other places across the province where they're working to reduce the cesarean section rate. So I think there's things, take home messages that we'll be able to learn from groups who have successfully done this. This is a rate of episiotomy uh, by Lynn Burt. And again, there's been evidence for quite some time that um, you know, there isn't, <clears throat> as, there isn't as much need for episiotomy as we once thought there were, but there is still uh, practice differences across the province. Now, to be fair, we should probably break this down into those that have spontaneous vaginal delivery and those that have assisted vaginal delivery because the rate of episiotomy will likely be higher in the assisted vaginal delivery. But um, I would say overall, there's still work to do to, um, to bring this rate down. And you can see it is coming down, which is good. So Still, still more to do. And this is the proportion of women with interpartum complications by Lynn region. So again, we've grouped these ones by Lynn region. Um, so yeah, you can see it goes from the southwest part of the province to the central west, to the G or sorry, central, GTA, southeast, Champlain, and north, and then the rates for the province. So lots of women having complications, and you can see those listed below. This might include things like meconium in labor, non-progressing labor, intrapartum bleeding, uh, non-reassuring uh, non fetal status, which in the new database has been changed to reflect the new terminology of atypical or abnormal uh, fetal status, uh, shoulder dystocia, suspected choreo, things like that. So lots of complications. This is the rate of pain management among women who had a vaginal live birth. Um, and this is a busy slide, but basically the orange line is what you want to see here, and that's basically the rate of regional anesthesia that's happening across the province. So in Ontario, about 63% of women who had a vaginal live birth used some form of regional anesthesia, and 18.6% um, of women used another form of analgesia. So, you know, whether that's narcotics <clears throat> or some form of entinox or something like that. And you can see what's happening in your various LIN. And again, these slides will be available on the website if you want to take a closer look at your own data. And this is just to show us the orange is the regional anesthesia and the black is the um, uh, um, other forms of anesthesia. So pretty steady. This is fetal mortality rate. Um, and again, this is uh, rate per thousand. And so you see the confidence intervals around the rates um, there. 
because uh, you know we have the precise numbers, but when you project it to a rate per thousand, you need to put the confidence interval around it to show you. So the smaller the confidence interval, the more sure you are that that rate falls within there 95% of the time. And so you can see there are, um, the rate for Ontario is 3.66. We were learned yesterday that that's a little bit less than the Canadian rate. Um, uh, but we still have some uh, challenges, I would say, collecting uh, fetal mortality and stillbirth data across the province. And the born regional coordinators are working with all of the hospitals in the province to make sure that we have those stillbirths classified properly. Really important um, so that we can capture accurately what's happening in Ontario and compare to the rest of Canada. And uh, the folks in Toronto will see that certainly the Toronto Central Inn is uh, almost double. There are two major tertiary care centers that do a lot of births in the Toronto Central area that would have a lot more of the higher risk pregnancies where we'd expect this to happen. So I think probably if we were auditing that, we would go looking for some information on that. And this is the rate of preterm birth uh, by line of birth. Again, this is just all preterm birth, less than 37 weeks. The vast majority of preterm birth is in that 30, um, sort of 34 to 37 week period, the late preterm birth. Um, and we can break this down further. I can tell you about less than 1% of all babies are born at less than 30 weeks. So, um, you know, there's a lot in between there. So again, the Toronto Central Region um, sticks out there, but again, a large proportion of uh, women with risk are, are being delivered there. And this is the rate of preterm birth in Ontario. Really important as an indicator of uh, longer term health. And so getting to the bottom, I mean, many, many people have been working on solving the preterm birth issue. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, we have much work to do, but um, we seem to have a little bit of a decrease, which is good. This is birth weight in grams. So what this shows us in the gray bars is that the vast majority of babies are born uh, within the weight of 2,500 to 4,000 grams. Um, but <clears throat> certainly there are some bigger babies being born, which is the orange lines at the top, anywhere sort of from 10%, and I think we'll see that in just a minute with the SGA and LGA um, levels that we see there. And this is the distribution of gestational age. So again, um, you know, as we saw, the vast majority of babies were born at term, but these are the babies that are born at less than 32 weeks, 32 to 33 weeks, and 34 to 36 weeks. So in the province of Ontario, it looks like um, less than 32 weeks is somewhere close to probably 15%, um, 32 to 33 weeks of the yellow. Check that. That seems really high to me. Um, so we'll check this slide again. So we'll come back. To, we'll take a look at that one and we'll correct it if it's wrong. This is the rate of small for gestational age uh, babies. Uh, birth weight below the 10th centile by Lynn. <clears throat> and so again, you see a little bit of difference across the province picking out your Lynn. And again, uh, small for gestational age babies are more likely to have other complications as they grow. And so that it's important to look at that in your particular region and find out what's going on in relationship to that. Um, is it the socioeconomic group you're serving? Is there risk factors in pregnancy that might be leading to that? And then the LGA, the larger gestational age, which we know seems to be higher in the north, um, bigger babies. Uh, this would certainly have a relationship to um, uh, certainly uh, diabetes, but uh, obesity in the population as well. And as we mentioned earlier, the rate of multiple births in the population. I think we're getting close to being done. We're some time for Sherry to throw a few things in about reporting. And this is just the distribution of multiple births. So you can see the vast majority of twins and smaller numbers of higher order multiple births, which is certainly what we want. Um, um, those, those pregnancies are difficult for moms and certainly challenging for healthcare providers. And so just to finish up, a little bit of um, data on the babies. These are the babies that are born with a five minute APGAR score less than seven by line of birth. Um, and um, APGAR scores, you know, again, quite subjective, um, but certainly important. So the five-minute APGAR score is, is more important. That's the one that tends to have more of a relationship to longer-term outcomes. Ideally, what we'd like to do is to have a score where, or to have a, 
an indicator where we could look at APGAR scores combined with cord gases. And I think in subsequent years, we'll be able to do that better as we have better ascertainment of, of cord gases. In the system. This is exclusive breastfeeding at discharge among term live infants, and we saw that uh, in the first set of big slides. Uh, so again, work, we're at about 63%. There's still some missing data and data quality issues around the province. We have cleaned up our breastfeeding indicators and data elements in the 2012 uh, database. So we'll be able to have a little bit more accurate reporting as we go forward on this. But really important to capture this information. And finally, prenatal screening. Um, this is the ratio of prenatal screening by line of residence. And this means close to about 70% of women who gave birth actually were screened. Um, you know, we don't have, in the, in the historical data, we don't have every woman that was screened. Going forward, we will. But these are of the women who gave birth. So. Is there access issues in the north? Is it choice? Um, and, and I know that our group here is doing a, a project to look at why there are differences. And I know that the folks at ISIS have done some work on that as well. And this is the proportion of women who were screened for GBS streptococcus among women who delivered a term, which is the clinical practice guideline. We're doing well in the province with this. Uh, we've just changed the data elements in the new system so that we can capture the women who actually declined screening, so we have a better idea about that as well. So doing well in that. This is the number of infants uh, from newborn screening who had their screening completed and the proportion of screen positive. So you can see in Ontario, just a little less than 1% of all babies that you folks do the blood spot on screen positive and need to have follow-up. And so, um, and there's been a concerted effort to improve the quality of newborn screening across the province. And, and people have taken that up well and, and are helping us improve that. And this is uh, newborn screening completed um, by Lynn region of residents. This is when we've grouped the Lynns together. And so you can see still about one, a little less than one. And so that finishes the data. And again, just to thank you all for contributing the data to Born. And to remind you, which Sherry's going to talk about now, that you have a robust reporting system at your fingertips that you can go in and now take a look at this data yourself for your own setting and break it down further to see what's driving some of these issues in your setting. Thanks, Anne. And so together with the Born reporting team, uh, we've had several webinars over uh, the course of the Born Information System going live telling you exactly about the various types of reports. So I'm just going to give you a high level view. And so like Anne said, once you've worked so hard to collect the data, enter it into the Born Information System, really the first step is to uh, take a look at the quality of data. So within what we call the standard reports, there's an administrative data set, reporting set and so that you can look at reconciling your numbers, making sure that all your encounters are complete. Um, and basically making sure there's no missing data. And you use the administrative reports to do that. And what we call acknowledging the data at the end of the month to acknowledge that it's complete. And once you're happy with your data, you can go in and you can use the clinical reports that are available to you to look at um, the various things that are of interest. If it's the number of births, if it's the number of C-sections, um, if see how you're doing with your breastfeeding and so on. So those are the standard reports. Uh, the second type of report is hopefully what you've already heard about or you use in your hospital is the maternal newborn dashboard, one of the dashboards that we've already released, and that's an audit and feedback tool. And again, we're working to develop further dashboards. And the last type of report is called the CUBE. Um, that tool is going to be coming soon, and it's basically a tool that allows you to create custom queries. So you can go in and you can pull any um, an indicator and you can basically um, split it down even further into um, various, uh, you know, particular maybe age group or parity or other things that you want to look at. So that cube is coming soon. So I just gave you at the bottom of the screen here a screenshot of what it looks like when you go into the Born Information System for those of you who haven't been, and hopefully a lot of users on the phone have been in, and you go and you look on the right hand side, there's in blue, uh, the word set that says reporting, you click on that. And it leads you into these four tabs, and those are the types of reports that I was just talking about. The first tab will show you your, um, at this time, if you're a hospital user, your maternal newborn dashboard. Otherwise, you might want to go to your administrative reports to look at your data quality. And then you would go into your clinical reports to pull data out. 
And the last tab won't be visible to you just yet because we haven't report we haven't launched the analytical reporting to no to tool known as the cube. So next slide. So I really want to tell you today just about the new um, biz reports that have launched uh, in the, since the last um, born provincial round, which was in March, that we talked about the reporting in the biz. And since then, we've had various reports that have been rolled out. So if you happen to be to be a midwifery practice group user, or you would have access now to the midwifery care profile report. Um, there are a few reports in the set, and one is known as the demographics report. And that's to get out your basic numbers and rates of the demographic of your population. So for instance, age, um, the numbers of births, and all the utilization indicators. So if you're a midwifery user, hopefully you've used that report. And the second midwifery report that is rolled out is called the forward sortation area. And this is basically uh, the number of women, but it's split up by forward sortation area. And that's the first three digits of the maternal postcode. So those are the two new midwifery care profile reports that have been launched since March. Uh, the second type of report is a really um, we are excited to launch is the NICU or special care nursery profile report, and that's for you know users in um, the the high level of care sites who want to just look at their numbers of admission by gestational age, birth weight, acuity, as well as some outcomes and the distribution of the length of stay, which is always very important. We want to know how long these infants that get transferred to NICU or special care nursery stay in hospital. And the last um, standard report I'm going to tell you about is of a, of a set of reports known as the profile of birth. So there are five different reports, and we've just, we've just launched the fourth report called Birth Mother. And I'm going to show you next what those indicators are. So this is a screen which just basically has a long list of indicators, but over on the left, uh, hand side are two reports we, we launched when we launched the born information system, and those are the key indicator reports for mother and for the infant, and you can see the long list of indicators. Over in the middle are our profile of birth reports, and like I just said, we launched the birth mother report, so you can see here, excuse me, that within here you can look at the, um, the pain management, the episiotomy, and the type of birth, as well as, for instance, C-section for anesthesia. Anesthesia, anesthesia. So those are the different types of indicators in the profile of birth, birth mother report. As well as in the NICU SCN profile report, you can see down here, do you want to look at, for instance, arterial cord blood gas or venous cord blood gases for those babies that were transferred to the NICU? If that's the type of user you are, you would run the NICU SCN profile report. And over on the right-hand side is just a list of some of the specialty reports, like, I, like Anne has already mentioned, um, the Robson C-section monitoring report, um, something that has been launched um, uh, throughout the country, the Baby Friendly Initiative, but we have a report that will give you your BFI staff, as well as, like I mentioned, the, the midwifery care profile reports. And as part of the dashboard, we have a maternal newborn dashboard report that accompanies the dashboard, as well as, of course, the, the, the first step is the administrative data quality report. And as part of the born information system, when you enter your patient, or your mom or your baby into the born information system before discharge, you can run and the newborn profile on discharge and hand it to the mother. The mother then takes that um, report to her healthcare provider on the first baby visit. So those are the reports that are available in the system, and I just give you a quick view of the new report. And lastly, to mention, of course, our maternal newborn dashboard. We've, uh, since last March, made enhancements to the report to include what we call sub-report tabs, and that is for all the six key performance indicators that are listed here at the bottom, you can drill down and you can see, uh, for instance, if you had um, higher rates of, of formula supplementation, you really want to know which uh, client records those link to. You can run your sub-report. And I just have a quick screenshot of what the sub-report would look like. This is all um, dummy or mock data. Don't anyone be alarmed. But for instance, for KPI3, formula supplementation at discharge in term infants whose mothers intended to breastfeed, you can see that, for instance, there might be two records that fall into the, the various criteria. So yes, they intended to breastfeed, but unfortunately, the newborn feeding at discharge were that either they were fed formula only or combination. So then you can go back to the chart number, the chart ID, and click on that ID, and it links you directly back to that patient's profile. So that's how you can drill down and do your audit very quickly. And these are the other three key performance indicators, just to show you an example of what the sub-report looks like. And lastly, coming soon, of course, uh, we want to have public health unit uh, users 
to gain access to the Warrant Information System, and they have three standard reports that will be available to them if they uh, qualify for access. And lastly, the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children report is something that we're working hard to get the, the report out to the users that, uh, uh, that require this report. And just to end off, I'm going to hand it back to Sandy shortly to take some questions. But if you need further resources for biz reporting, there is something called a biz reporting roadmap. And so you can go in and get your roadmap at this website down here. And we have training materials for every webinar we've ever done concerning the biz report. And you can click on those training materials. You can either view the slides or you can, use, you can view the webinar video. So I'm going to then hand it back to Sandy Dunn, who's going to take questions. Thanks so much, Ann and Sherry. What a wonderful overview. A lot of information, uh, I know, for everybody that you've presented. But as they both said, the information is available uh, on the website. The slides will be available. And of course, this webinar will be available eventually in the next little while. So there is a question oh, I see. A comment. Oh, a comment in the chat box. Yeah, it's about a mistake on one of the slides, yeah. and, and we'll and we'll no. take that and fix it. Okay. Actually, it's, it's, sorry. So just to be clear, it's not actually a mistake. It's just something that uh, you have to really get into that indicator and understand it well. Um, I know it. It says that uh, for the elective repeat C-section less than 39 weeks. That's correct. But the denominator is actually um, between 37 and 42 weeks. So the percentages of the women that had the C-section less than 39 weeks, which that's the numerator, the denominator is between 37 and 42 weeks. So the, the actual x-axis label is for the denominator. So it's of the women that had a, a C-section before 39 weeks, how many of those were between 37 and 42 weeks? I know that's a bit confusing, but it's actually the label for the denominator. So it is a good point for us maybe to go in and just add a note that adds the full definition, which is available on the dashboard but wasn't available on the slide. So thanks to Kristen. Um, remember, you can phone in your question if you uh, would like to. You press 01 to put your call into the queue and 02 to take your call out of the queue. So I'll just check with uh, Laura, who's our assisting us online. Laura, do you see anybody in the phone queue at all? No. Okay, thanks. So, um, so we'll just take a minute um, uh, while we see if anybody types in any more questions. Remember, you can type in a question, the lower um, left-hand corner of your, um, or the chat box at the upper left-hand corner of your screen. There is a little a bubble there. If you click on it, you can type in a question. So please feel free while we have Ann and Sherry here um, to point out some information. Or if anyone on the site that are listening have any thoughts with respect to some of the rates that are portrayed clustered by Lynn uh, for some of the indicators, if you have any, any questions or any thoughts related to some of the um, the data that you see, please feel free to uh, to uh, add your comment to the chat box or or go ahead and ask a, a question. Uh, just while we wait, I will say um, what we are planning to do for our next Born Provincial Rounds, which will be the last Thursday of November. We're, we're normally targeting the third Thursday of November, but we delayed October's rounds by one week. Um, and we are going to do the same for November for logistic reasons. Um, so you can look for that being the last Thursday of November. And what we're hoping to do is to focus our discussion on the Maternal Newborn Dashboard 6 indicators specifically and look at some trends by LINs and by level of care hospitals across the province just to get a flavor for what's been happening before we launch the, the dashboard and after. So you can, you can look for that if anyone is is interested. So, uh, you know, I think, Sandy, just again to, um, to thank all the folks who work so hard to collect and enter this data. Um, certainly, we here at Bourne Central appreciate it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think to remind you all that you have access to this data, you can use it for planning care in your settings, you can use it for quality improvement projects. Um, the data is there to be used by everybody. And so while we, you know, roll up the data to the bigger picture and, and use that data to inform Health Quality Ontario, Ministry of Health, and other uh, planning groups, 
um, certainly it's to be used by the people who, who enter the data, and that's the, the true value of, of having this kind of data at your fingertips. And if I just may add, for the biz reporting purposes, of course, if you have any questions about any of the reports, feel free to contact your born coordinator or Anne or myself, and someone will be sure to uh, provide the support you need if the training materials don't get you to where you need to be. And we always take comments and um, any kind of suggestions for improvements for our reports. Um, so there don't seem to be any questions coming in on the uh, in the chat box. So I think we probably it's a couple of minutes early, but we probably will um, uh, sign off. Uh, and I would just like to say for those of you who might have heard and some of you won't have heard that Sherry Kelly, our epidemiologist here at Bourne, who's been such a tremendous leader and such an asset to the team, is leaving us next week for new and exciting things in her future, and we just want to say thank you so much to her for all her work. Uh, we will miss her, and we wish her all the best in her, in her future travels. So on that note, I'll say thanks so much to everybody who took the time to join us. We appreciate you, um, you joining us, and we appreciate all the work you do to help uh, this Born Information System run. Stay tuned uh, for the announcement for the November Born Provincial Rounds coming out early November. Have a great afternoon, and we will talk to you in a month. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Bye, Bye. now.